Good morning, good day, and good evening. Thank you all for joining the MIRI Seminar on Current Affairs. My name is Petrusha Surova, and it is my honor and great pleasure to welcome all of you on the behalf of the organizer, Minority Issues Research Institute. Special thanks goes to the highly esteemed Professor Mitchell Orenstein, who has graciously accepted the invitation to give this talk today on the topic of the transformation of Europe after Russian aggression into Ukraine. Mitchell Orenstein is a professor of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Please allow me also uh, to acknowledge my colleagues, Daniela Škutova and Mirsad Kriestorac, who are senior researchers at MIRI and who are in charge of our capacity building and networking activities. Uh, before our honored guest gives his talk on this uh, timely uh, issue, uh, Dotan Škutova will briefly introduce to you the Department of Political Science, who is co-hosting this event with us. And then Dr. Mirsad Kriestoras will moderate discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon for all. As a member of the Department of Political Science, uh, it is an honor for me to participate in the coordination of today's seminar. The Department of Political Science participated with other faculty departments, such as uh, the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy and the Department of Security Studies particularly since the establishment of the faculty 20 years ago. Our Faculty of Political Science and International Relations, Matebel University, are attended by Slovak and foreign students, which represents a total of a 696 uh, students of which uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, pardon, uh, 237 students are from Ukraine. Therefore, I express my conviction that the topic of today's seminar will be interesting not only for Ukrainian students, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, I would like uh, to thank you in advance for accepting of today's online event. Thank you. Pardon? Uh, Mirsad, now you can take the floor. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Mirsad Kriesturac, and I'm joining you from South Florida. It is my pleasure to be with all of you today and moderate this important discussion with Dr. Mike, Michael Orenstein. As uh, Svetlusha have said, Dr. Orenstein is a professor and chair of Russian and Eastern European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. His published work has explored the political economy of transition in Central and Eastern Europe, and foreign policy of Russia and Eastern Europe. Most recently, he is the author of the book, The Lands in Between Russia and the West and the New Politics of Hybrid War, and co-authored the book, From Time to Crisis, Neoliberal Economic Reforms in Post-Communist Countries. He also previously authored two prize-winning books out of the red, Building Capitalism and Democracy in Post-Communist Europe, and privatizing pensions, the transitional campaign for social security reform. <clears throat> Dr. Orenstein also produced two books on European social policy with the World Bank, Roma in Expanding Europe, um, Breaking Poverty Cycle, and Pension Reforms in Europe, Process and Progress. Professor Orenstein research work lies at the intersection of comparative politics, international political economy, and international relations, employing a problem-driven <clears throat> research approach based on asking policy-relevant questions and answering them through in-depth field research. <clears throat> He's currently working on a new project on social impact of post-socialist transition, 
combining economic, demographic, <laughs> public opinion, and ethnographic data to present a holistic analysis of a complex and controversial topic that feeds into European debates about the rise of populism. It's not only European <laughs> anymore, right? Um, he's joining us today from Slovakia, and we appreciate his willingness to participate in the first mini seminars on the current affairs. We promise to continue. Um, the topic of today's conversation is transformation of Europe after European aggression into Ukraine. I hope uh, you all have read the abstract for today's conversation and know that Dr. Arnstein will elaborate on his observations about Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine, which have shattered and any remaining illusions that politics of interdependency and closer economic integrations with Europe would lead Russia toward democracy at home and peaceful coexistence with its neighbors abroad. Russian invasion instead reinvigorated the NATO, jolted the European Union into cutting off trade and energy ties with Russia while supporting Ukraine's struggle to defend itself. Russian invasion empowered Central and European states in the European Union, reignited enlargement debates and shifted NATO and European borders uh, further to the north and east. Yet this war has also brought the new challenges to the European Union to consolidate internally and, and adjust and harmonize their supranational energy policies, despite various levels of development and infrastructure capacity among member states. We are going to hear today from Professor Orenstein more on these challenges that European Union and Russia face, considering the limits of each other's spheres of influence in Eastern, in Eastern Europe and wider geopolitical space. As usual for this type of seminars, we are going to first hear the presentation by Dr. Orenstein for about like more or less 25 minutes. And then after that, we will open the discussion for your questions and answers. If you want to ask question in person, you're welcome to do so, but please uh, first raise your hand icon and we will call upon you. Once your microphone is on, please introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, and then ask your question. Those of you who cannot join over the microphone, you're welcome to type your questions in the chat box and we'll try to ask them on your behalf. And thank you all for your cooperation. And now let us turn our attention to Dr. Arnstein. Thank you. Um, thank, for, thank you, Professor um, uh, Shkutova. Thank you, Professor Kriyash um, I'm, And thank you, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Surova. <laughs> um, I'm super happy to be here uh, today and um, to speak to you about my research on the transformation of, um, of Europe um, after Russia's, um, Russia's aggression into Ukraine. So <clears throat> I've shared my screen, I hope, uh, done a pretty good job of that. Um, and um, you can see it. Um, I don't expect to speak for the entire 25 minutes because I wish to have plenty of time for your discussion and questions. Um, so I'll try to be a little quicker and just give a quick overview of this project, which is uh, a future book project. Um, I think it was mentioned already, I published uh, one book, The Lands in Between, Russia versus the West and the New Politics of Hybrid War that was published in 2019. I've now updated that in, a, in an updated um, paperback edition that will come out shortly, just coming, you know, basically filling in with some of the details of what happened, of course, during the war. And uh, my next project is, is based on how the war is changing Europe, and that's what I'll talk about today. So I think the place to start when looking at how the war has affected Europe is, is first from a, a rather positive angle. There, there are pluses and minuses, I think, for Europe, but um, the war really reaffirmed the European Union status as an economic and uh, humanitarian uh, superpower. Um, it, uh, sorry, I have to, I have to move the um, my screen around so I can see my own slides. Um, 
And um, the European Union, as you may remember, at the very beginning of the war, quickly responded to Russia's attack on Ukraine with extremely powerful economic sanctions. Um, the European Union also, and this is perhaps less known and appreciated, but it invoked for the very first time the Temporary per Protection Directive of 2001 that enabled Ukrainian refugees to access accommodation, um, the European labor market, medical care, education for minors, and social assistance in all the European Union states, uh, and also uh, uh, made a major change to European Union energy policy in an effort to not fund the war in, in Russia's war in Ukraine and to cut off uh, its financing of Russian gas. It uh, launched a Repower EU plan, which was a major, major uh, transformation of the energy sector that was aiming to that is is aiming to increase the use of renewable energy in Europe to about 45 percent by 2030, cut reliance on Russia, align energy and climate goals. So this was a very powerful and very timely and very unified response that I think we need to recognize. Um, you know just how important this was for Europe. It was a moment of enormous uh, European unity in the face of a very difficult um, set of events. And so I think that's the first thing we have to recognize this affirmation of, of Europe as, it, as, as a responding in a united way as an economic and humanitarian power. However, what we tend to focus on is of course also true, which is that the European Union has been unable to deliver a timely and unified security response um, uh, Julian Haworth, who's a British scholar, a uh, very pro-European British scholar, but he says that the, the crisis in Ukraine has highlighted the weaknesses of the EU as an international actor. Although it is an economic, commercial, and regulatory giant, it has not succeeded in emerging as a significant military or security actor. So the EU itself has uh, little uh, military power. What we learned in February 2022 is it has little decision making capability. Um, the decisions that were, critical decisions that were made in this arena were made in the context of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and this sent uh, the European Union into a sort of identity crisis, I think, of sorts, which, as was mentioned, it shattered the, any illusions that had been remaining, for instance, in Germany and France, of integrating Russia economically, leading to uh, peace with its, in its neighborhood. It more deeply undermined what De La Sala calls the ontological security and foundational myths of the European Union, the foundational myth being that closer integration will bring peace. Of course, it did do that among the member states, but failed to do that with regard to Russia. Um, it raised questions, uh, and it and it raises questions about going forward if that can be um, the approach that the European Union continues to take or not. It raised questions whether Europe can rise to the challenges of a liberal international order, which is in the process of fragmentation, and um, questions about whether the EU is becoming more integrated in the security sphere. A number of people point to the EU did take measures that led to more security integration, but overall, this was a moment of, of soul searching, a moment of failure, especially if you look at um, the fact that, that for military and security matters, all the member states pretty much, maybe except for France, were looking to coordinate within the context of NATO, another organization, obviously, in Europe. So Emmanuel Macron very um, powerfully spoke about this, arguing that Europe should seek to achieve strategic autonomy from the United States and, um, and from really any other actor, including Ukraine, but that it should uh, be able to have its own military capacity uh, to face problems on its own. And this did not happen, obviously, during, during this time. On the other hand, um, so I think you have on the one hand, you have economic, uh, 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 you know, a, a strong economic a response, a poor security response. But then also Europe has been changed very much by the reopening of the border issue and the reopening of the, um, the enlargement debate. As many of you know um, from Central and Eastern Europe, 
enlargement debate has been frozen. The last new member of the EU was taken in in 2013. That's exactly 10 years ago, and that was Croatia. Um, but since then, there's been no enlargement. There's been enlargement fatigue in Europe. The Western Balkans have been in a holding pattern. Um, this uh, invasion reignited the enlargement debate in part because Finland and almost Sweden, um, uh, uh, who were neutral states, uh, decided to join NATO. Um, and Ukraine and Moldova, in fact, the, the even of the EU proper, Ukraine and Moldova were given candidate status, which is de facto a change in the map of Europe. So it raises a number of questions within the European Union, uh, you know, about whether Europe's borders are moving further to the north and further to the east. Has the enlargement progress process been reignited? Will Ukraine and Moldova endure the same type of purgatory that uh, Western Balkan states have endured, or an expedited process that may take in not only Ukraine, but also Moldova, and possibly even in some of the Western Balkan states as well. This uh, point I think is less often made, but very significant is that I believe that the invasion substantially changed internal politics of the EU, particularly on, on security and defense policy. It, it produced a substantial loss of face for France and Germany who had, not, who had not done enough to counter the Russian challenge. Uh, it embarrassed uh, uh, Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, former Kant Chancellor Merkel, who was identified very strongly with the, uh, uh, the sort of Ostpolitik uh, towards Russia. Um, it led to um, a loss of clout, basically, of France and Germany within the European Union, where you've seen in the course of the war, Britain, which isn't even in the EU, taking a much stronger uh, and more leadership role in uh, facing security challenges of Europe and uh, where Poland and some of the frontline states such as Finland and the Baltic states are now having a greater say. There's, it's widely uh, uh, spoken in the European Union that uh, the Polish and Baltic position on Russia was right, the German position was wrong, and uh, lessons need to be taken, including that those countries need to be paid more attention to in the future. People are talking about the Weimar Triangle, the uh, a kind of approach that to European Union security that might include France, Germany, Poland. Um, so this is a very big, uh, a very big change. And of course, the voice of Ukraine has also been raised very, very strongly in this, in this debate where it probably had almost no impact before on European Union decision-making. Now, Zelensky has been able to shame Europe into, um, into a number of uh, decisions. So um, some may have heard uh, this book, this, you know, um, uh, and now I'm forgetting the author of the book who compared uh, Europe to Mars, I mean, Europe to Venus and the United States and maybe Russia to Mars you know, as a kind of convenient sort of metaphor. Um, the European Union, of course, is, is known and in fact valued for being a custodian of the peace. Uh, the European Union, in fact, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. And um, its inter peace through integration approach has been extremely valuable. However, it's always been uh, combined in European security with NATO, which, which combines many of the same countries in a different sort of approach, which is, I, I could, you could say, is peace through strength, the idea of deterrence, the idea that uh, only by being having a strong military presence can one deter um, uh, those who might seek to uh, uh, conduct war in Europe. And um, in fact, European security has always relied, since the Second World War, has relied on both of these approaches. But the crisis brought home to Europe um, their unsettling reliance on NATO. After years of EU triumphs and enlargement and democratization, and a sense that um, that uh, that it was now uh, that they hadn't done enough um, to achieve uh, peace through strength, I think basically. So I was looking for you know a kind of um, allegory of ESDP. Um, you know, I was talking about, you know, Mars and Venus, and I, I, I found this painting by Botticelli from 1483, 
which portrays Mars and Venus lying together, um, together with a few satyrs, um, you know, representing that, you know, both, both ends, sides of, of a single um, element of European security and defense policy, you have, in fact, both Mars and Venus represented there. So to be very quick to the conclusions, and I think I'll just end here, is to say what we are in fact seeing, if we draw these points together, I believe that what we are seeing is in fact a more geopolitical Europe emerging, uh, where European Union is an economic superpower, a green energy and humanitarian leader. Uh, and NATO is cooperating closely in uh, projecting peace through strength and is going to be, that is going to be elevating in the coming years with rearmament in Germany and France and rearmament in Ukraine and in many uh, of the European Union states are going to in fact invest a higher proportion of their GDP in military production. Um, Europe's borders, um, I believe are solidifying. So if you recall back to just a few years ago, in theory, the European Union didn't really have borders. Right? It didn't really have an eastern border or even a southern border in the sense that um, that it was membership in the union was really left open kind of for other countries to decide what the European Union frequently told Ukraine and I think probably also told, you know, even Morocco uh, to some extent is that, you know, it's not impossible for you to become members of the European Union. There's a lot you would need to do, you know, um, you would need to change your democracy, perhaps you need to change your markets. But in theory, um, in theory, membership was open um, to all countries, I think, in the European neighborhood. Now, I think what we're going to see is a more intentional policy towards borders where Europe is forced to define um, what its borders are. Um, Russia is out. Um, the Ukraine is in, uh, Moldova is in, uh, and in the Western Balkans, I think there will be this discussion of which countries are geopolitically important uh, for the European Union to have. And, uh, and what will emerge then, I think, is a, uh, a situation in which there's a, a, a zone of integration that's better defined of what it is, of where peace through integration can be achieved. And um, a zone outside, a, 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 an external um, zone of power projection and maybe principled pragmatism where the European Union recognizes that no, those countries outside of our borders are not going to um, you know, uh, in, entirely be integrated. And we need to also um, respond in a sort of uh, either in a pragmatic way or in a a way in which um, of power projection. I'll just end with just a, a, a photo of Josep Borrell, who made this unfortunate statement that um, that uh, he, he said that Europe is a garden surrounded by a jungle. Um, this was a terrible way to make this statement, but I think he was because you know of all the sort of um, you know various types of implications that there was made. But I do think that, that what he was talking about probably will occur, that the European Union is going to um, uh, define its borders and become more integrated inside and, and regard the outside world with somewhat less idealism. So thank you very much. That's really all I wanted to say to start. And of course, I'm happy to take all of your questions. Believe me, um, you can't ask me a tough question that is you know tougher than what I've already you know, can handle. <laughs> so please don't feel like you have to be too polite um, and just ask what you're thinking and uh, I'd be happy to respond. Well, thank you, Dr. Arstein. Um, it is a, a good overview of your approach to this uh, question. Obviously you're dealing primarily with Europe, which is really interesting by itself. So you didn't talk much about Russia, but let's see, we already have a first question by Alejandro Tozon. Please, uh, Alejandro, join us. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, remember you please introduce yourself and tell us where you are joining us from and then ask your question. Of course. Good morning, everybody. Obviously, you already know me, Professor. I am one of um, Professor Hercules' old students. He was graceful enough to invite me to his lecture. Um, I'm here in Miami, Florida, and uh, 
Dr. Orenstein, I, I was very interested by some of the points you made, and I agreed with a lot of them. I kind of just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, it's two ultimate questions. The first one being, where do you see the division of power being struck as far as NATO security forces? Because historically, I think they either commit too little after the fact or too little before the fact, and that's detrimental to them at the end of the day. So I think they're kind of having an identity crisis right now, and I want you to know, I want you to, I wanted to ask you, what would you see being a situation in Europe in which NATO would decisively put boots on the ground in a conflict? And my second question is, uh, what do you see the ultimate status of Ukraine being at the end of this conflict? Do you see them being forced into a demilitarized sort of deal? Do you see a rump state being carved out to be a buffer between NATO and Russia? I, I just wanted your perspective on these things. Yeah, th th those are wonderful. Do you want to collect questions or should I directly answer these questions? Uh, unless there is um, any other questions. Uh, do we have any other questions? Well, maybe we start with this one and then we go on. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I, I think that, let me start with the second question, which is the status of Ukraine at the end of this conflict. In 2011, I believe, or 2012, um, Maybe it was, yeah, it was, no, actually it was, I think it was around 2008 or 2000, 2009 or 2010. I led a group of students to Ukraine. Um, I was lucky, I was teaching at Johns Hopkins Sice at the time, and we had a long winter break and I would take my students to Europe. Um, and we visited Ukraine and um, my students who many of them were going into the US Foreign Service um, none of them thought that Ukraine would eventually join NATO, but I was telling them, you know, in 30 years, you know, Ukraine is going to be in the European Union. And that was like considered like wildly crazy by my, my students, but I still believe that. I think that, I think that what we're seeing now is that Ukraine will in fact be in the European Union within its 1991 borders. And I believe also that Ukraine will be in NATO. So when you ask of the status at the end of the conflict is that um, Ukraine has uh, somehow, and we can debate how this happened, but has somehow convinced Europe, uh, European Union leading states, Germany, France, um, Britain, and also the United States, that it is a member of the free world so-called. It is a member, it is a democratic state, which it has been remarkably uh, democratic, of course, with many problems, but, They've had many, many democratic elections in Ukraine uh, that resulted in changes of government. It's considered a member of the European family, according to uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and it will be a member of the European Union. It will be a member of NATO. I think that's where this is all heading. And that's, of course, why Russia is fighting the war, because it's not happy with that outcome. Um, in terms of NATO, you know, NATO had... Um, Russia, Russia says, and, and it may not be entirely wrong, that it um, wishes NATO to back off and it's, it's fighting this war against NATO somehow. But in fact, NATO's um, force posture in Europe has declined dramatically since the end of the Cold War. At the end of the Cold War, the US had 300,000 troops in, in Europe and many, many tanks. Today it has no tanks and it has 30,000 troops in Europe. Um, some of whom um, are are in the um, uh, are in the Central and East European countries, trying to create some type of buffer um, against the Russian invasion, but not sufficient, as you say, to defeat any sort of invasion. So um, there's been this uh, kind of odd contradiction that one can have different points of view about, but one of them is, as you say, is that NATO has done too little. To in fact defend or in fact um, to in fact defend Europe, and I think um, what is happening in Europe. And I was just at the Warsaw Security Conference. Um, in general, I would say that European officials there believe that the United States may not um, have, uh, over the long term, sufficient reason to uh, defend Europe, and therefore they're rearming, they're building weapons, they're they're rebuilding their militaries. 
Um, and France, for instance, is getting ready to defend European continent, which has not been its focus. Germany is announced that they're going to be building weapons factories in Ukraine. Um, it is very committed. I know there's been a crazy debate about the Zeitenwende in Germany, but just let me tell you that that, that is done and Germany is very, very committed um, to Ukraine security. So I think that, um, that, uh, that, yeah, that's, I think that, that yes, you could argue it's been too little, but I think there is a response and, and it will ultimately result in, in those changes. Okay, thank you. All right, fantastic, thank you so much. Those were great answers. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else has a question? Um, <clears throat> questions, anybody? No. As of now, uh, maybe I can ask you a question while we're waiting for people to... Um... Or maybe, you know, you, you can also put your questions into the chat. So I'm looking at the chat. I can see your questions in the chat. It may be more comfortable for people to put some questions in the chat. Yes, yes. I did offer that if you cannot, if you cannot or do not want to turn the microphone on, you can just type it in and we'll ask on your behalf. But I can ask, so piggybacking of this uh, um, answer that you gave, so you do believe that this is essentially um, um, why Russia attacked Ukraine, right? It is about ontological security, or maybe something else is in play, considering the cost that Russia has to incur for this war. I mean, what, what do you think really led uh, Russian leaders, including Putin, to go into this? It kind of, it, it's really almost irrational. I mean, yeah, I see what you're saying about that. You know, it's it's very hard to know exactly. I have to say that I was among the people who um, I saw very clearly, I think, what the consequences of this war were, were going to be. At the beginning of the war, I would have said to you exactly this. I would have said the consequences of this war will be that Russia is slapped with the biggest sanctions ever that Finland and Sweden will join NATO and that Russia will never defeat Ukraine. Those are the things I would have said. In fact, I did say at the beginning of the conflict. But my view at that time is that, that Russian intelligence knowing that, whoops, it looks like I got dropped out. No, no, we hear you. We hear you still. Oh. We, yes. <laughs> it seems like I got disconnected a little bit and then reconnected. Okay. so. Um, so you can see me now as well, yes? yes. Um, so uh, I think that, um, the re but I thought that Russia knowing that would decide not to invade Ukraine because those were such serious consequences. But I think that you're right, you know, when you say ontological security, that, that's, that Putin, what I think I missed and many other people missed was that Putin had somehow uh, convinced himself that as he said in some of his pre-war speeches, that um, that Russia believed that it was united, you know, it, it was a common nation, a single nation of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, right? And that it was unhappy, you know, it 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 wouldn't uh, support, you know, Ukraine splitting off. It just simply didn't believe that Ukraine was an independent nation, which had been going on for a very long time, and was seeing increasing trends towards Ukraine. Of becoming more and more Western. And yes, that was fundamentally challenging to the ontological security of Russia at that time, which, which whose doctrine was that um, Ukrainians are the same people as us. They're part of this Slavic Brotherhood. They're, um, they simply can't, we cannot exist as a state. We cannot be secure as a state without Ukraine. In other words, an imperial mindset, right? So, um, so yes, I think that's the, been the problem all along. That's what I wrote about in my book, The Lands in Between, is that, you know, that that what we're really seeing at the base of it is a conflict between, and you could say, two civilizations, or I would prefer to say, two different perspectives on European security. The European Union perspective, which I mapped out, which is that the closer integration we have on the continent among democratic states, the more peace we have, right? That's the way Europe perceives things. And frankly, it was also very hard to convince Europe that that wasn't, that was, that its own perspective was seen as a threat to somebody else, right? 
it was hard for Europe, which won the Nobel Prize, to think, yeah, our promotion of democratization in Ukraine or in Russia is perceived as an existential threat, you know, by the Russian uh, government. Likewise, Europe simply will not understand that Russia uh, can only be secure when it owns some other country, you know, even if it has to bomb it into oblivion, right? That just doesn't really make a lot of sense to people. So you have this really clash of perspectives about what creates security in Europe with Europe having a, uh, the EU being based on these two pillars is essentially a complex organization which elevates the uh, national interests of so many member states, but within a common pooling of resources um, and uh, security. And Russia um, wants to have a great power um, relationship with its neighbors, which most Europeans would say is simply not something that's going to advance European security. And so, so we do have this inevitable clash that's going on right now. I thought that uh, maybe there would be um, some way to paper that over, honestly, but I think now we know that there's no way, at least with Putin in control, there's no way to do that. The, and that's why I would say that the only end to this conflict is when um, Ukraine is secure in um, NATO and the European Union. Uh, but would that not mean end to Russia itself? Because there are lots of people who are talking about that. I mean, first of all, is it really unclear? Is it offensive or defensive act that Putin is doing? And then also, like I said, if that ends the way you say, um, the Ukrainian whatever officials are talking about the end of Russia, there are voices from Russia who are also talking about possible breakout of Russia. Um, and if Ukraine joins uh, uh, NATO, as you say, would that end Russia? Yes, I mean, um, so it doesn't, it doesn't need to. I think, I think the perspective of the West on Russia generally is that Russia needs to make an adjustment um, to stop having, an, to, to stop thinking that it, it is, deserves some European empire and to behave and think of itself more as a nation state that has defined borders that were defined by the um, treaty, Bielovieja um, Treaty that ended the Commonwealth of Independent States. The West is happy with Russia's borders. Um, uh, no, no country in the West uh, questions Russia's right to exist within its borders. Um, but, um, but those treaties are understood in the West to indicate that, that Ukraine and Belarus, in fact, are independent states that can make their own decisions about um, policy. So I don't think that there's any need for Russia to break up. And frankly, I would consider that to be a rather low probability instance. But you're right that many in the Russian opposition and many Ukrainians also, and many Russians are talking about how can Russia exist as a nation state? Well, it's not a huge mystery. A lot of empires in Europe have become nation states. Austria you know, has become a nation state, right? To mention one that's very close by. It used to be an empire, now it's a nation state. It's much, much Britain, Britain has been a nation, an empire that used to be, you know, is now a nation state. Germany, you know, so the thing the, the you know, the view I think in Europe is simply that Russia needs to finally get with the program, Turkey. I mean, it, it finally needs to get with the program and just accept that the age of empire is over. Most people in Europe have found a better way um, and uh, they're not going to give it up. And, you know, and in fact, more countries want to join this European Union. So, um, you know, if Russia thinks they have to split, that's their own issue, you know, but honestly, I don't, I don't think it will come to that. And I don't think certainly that's not the aim, you know, for of Europe or the United States, for that matter, or NATO, you can see that very clearly, because there's a strong, there's no chance, I think that, um, that NATO is going to march into Russia or anything like that. And in fact, has been very restrained and restraining the Ukrainians, even though it would help Ukraine actually to um, to, you know, uh, operate, um, you know, in Russia. Okay, thank you. We have Paulina's um, uh, raised the, the, the hand. And so Paulina, please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're coming from. And then we have also a question from Yakub Adametz uh, uh, posted in the chat. Yeah, 
Yes, uh, good morning. Um, I am uh, Paulina Szalan from a uh, university in Krakow. And uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your interesting presentation. And I am just going to ask you two questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to know your opinion about um, engagement of the United States of America in the conflict in Ukraine. And uh, what kind of uh, possibilities of this engagement with the uh, European uh, countries uh, you see? I am thinking about uh, any kind of prospects in this uh, relations. And uh, my second question is the question about the uh, opinion of uh, US uh, citizens on this conflict and uh, US engagement in this conflict. Um, are they... Um, thinking uh, something different that the government, that the president, or uh, they are on the same page? Uh, are they on the same page, actually? Uh, so uh, thank you in advance for uh, your answer. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, the engagement of the US really has been, the US has exercised leadership where I think, you know, unfortunately, European Union states did not exercise leadership in the early days of the war to rise to the defense of Ukraine and to begin sending weapons to Ukraine. Actually, the UK probably played a, an even earlier role. The UK, you may recall, was sending weapons to Ukraine prior to the outbreak of war um, and probably doing even a little more than the United States um, at that point. But the United States has provided $100 billion of uh, military assistance. It's been absolutely essential for Ukraine to be able to fight the war. I think that's maybe as far as it goes, I mean, I guess if I were to guess also that there's definitely an intelligence capability that's also being used. The U.S., you know, maybe sharing its intelligence with Ukraine probably is. Um, but that's, I think, pretty much what we're talking about right now. Um, there aren't going to be uh, U.S. soldiers in Ukraine. Um, um, uh, there may be British soldiers there doing training as far as that's what Russia accuses. And I, I, I guess that meant that might be true, but I don't know. But I think the opinion of the US citizens, that's been in the news a lot recently because um, our Congress is going um, you know, crazy basically. And for the first time in US history, got rid of the um, Speaker of the House because um, a group of pro-Putin um, uh, Republicans, a small group in the House um, ousted the, uh, the leader because they were unhappy with, they wanted the government to shut down and the government, and then the speaker made a deal with the Democrats not to shut down the government. So they were unhappy. Um, you know, I guess it shows, uh, what it shows about opinion is that, yeah, there's a small group of pro-Putin Republicans in the Congress. That would be like six or 10, or I don't know exactly how many, maybe up to 20 um, out of 200. Um, and um, and they have uh, made some inroads into US opinion, particularly in the Republican Party. So the Republican Party is now, voters of the Republican Party are a bit divided on Ukraine. So some favor support for Ukraine and some are skeptical about support for Ukraine. I'm not sure, they never were asked like, do you support Russia? Uh, <laughs> or at least they don't report that. So I don't, I think the support for Russia still is very, very, very low. But, but some are probably also, you know, maybe may that, I don't know. But in the Democratic Party, there's a very solid support for, and, and I think, of course, the Congress is not exactly, you know, aligned always exactly with the uh, American people. But overall, there's a vast, huge support for Ukraine in this war in the United States that comes from public opinion. And, um, and not much um, enthusiasm for, for, for Russia's aggression. Um, so, um, I think that it's, um, you know, it's, it's certainly, um, possible that, um, that these, uh, that the Republican party will, and the Republican leaders like Mitch McConnell in the Senate are very strongly supportive of Ukraine. So I, I think that it's, that even with a, even if Trump were elected to be president in 2024, which is a possibility, it's possible that the um, his government, as it did before, will continue to support Ukraine. So we can't have any assumptions, I don't think, about changes, except that, of course, Trump's foreign policy is very unpredictable. So we don't exactly know what will happen. But I wouldn't think that it's automatic that he's going to uh, switch sides or something like that.
Very good. Okay, uh, we have two questions in the in the chat, but let's ask the also question. Uh, Mr. Chelen uh, have raised rose hand. Please turn on the microphone and let us know where you're joining us and ask your question. Good afternoon. Sorry. Good morning to you. I'm, I'm joining from Pristina, um, and I'm calling in my own capacity. Uh, to ask a question, actually to raise the point to Dr. Orenstein, thank you so much for the information and the briefing. Uh, apparently, how, what I took from your uh, uh, conferences, uh, you see the decline in Russian uh, influence and possible uh, power that could be exerted towards their Western uh, border. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you're also criticizing NATO and European Union for not do, being able to do enough uh, uh, to appeal uh, to the nations on the waiting line. Now, uh, don't you think uh, these two uh, uh, is going to leave a, a vacuum in the middle? And uh, won't you, would you like to revisit uh, the near uh, or midterm future for uh, Western Balkans, especially, uh, but mostly the other nations who are on the waiting line, which which could tend to both, especially Serbia on that perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I don't know if I'm as qualified to answer on the Western Balkans, but I would just reiterate, you know, kind of what I said before, that I think that Western, that enlargement is back on the agenda. I think that EU leaders um, are more focused on Ukraine because frankly, they view Ukraine as much more uh, geopolitically important right now in particular, right, at this moment. And so therefore there is, it seems to me, much more focus on Ukraine. Um, and it's likely that um, Western Balkans um, feels like it will be passed over and probably will be passed over to some extent. But at the same time, I think that um, that um, it has changed that concern and that worry of, in the Western Balkans that we're going to be uh, overshadowed by Ukraine may turn into a situation where, in fact, Ukraine is unblocking the pathway for the Western Balkans, right? Because it's a good question to ask, like why, if if not, if Ukraine can do it, why can't Western Balkans do it? And there's no good answer to that question, except that, yes. Um, and so I believe that what we're going to see is an emergence of a process where countries will be taken in on geopolitical grounds, as in fact, they already have, as they already have. I mean, the last enlargement, the 19 or the uh, 2007, 2004 enlargement of the European Union was also decided largely on geopolitical grounds. I mean. I believe that Bulgaria and Romania uh, were taken into the European Union largely because they were seen as important strategic states to have in, not only necessarily from a, from a security standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint. And, and uh, you know, Western business, West European businesses wanted uh, access to those markets, wanted access to the labor force, access to these territories. And, and that has been a good strategy actually for the European Union, it worked well. Um, I think that uh, a similar logic is going to be applied in the Western Balkans and we could begin to see some um, change in that situation. Even in the light of the latest uh, security challenges in the Kosovo since we have Right. I mean, that, that of course, complicates factors, right? I mean, so if Serbia were to invade Kosovo, obviously it would, it would extinguish Serbia's, you know, membership prospects, you know, for uh, a certain time. Um, Serbia may not invade Kosovo. It didn't invade, uh, you know, Bosnia, it didn't invade Croatia, but the war lasted four years. So um, maybe that will be done in some other way. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I think that that's obviously the the more you, you know well. I think that um, this this stability and security situation in general in the Western Balkans has been deteriorating, right? Um, in the last uh, few years, um, there's a chance of something happening. Russia, of course, is 
tried to provoke things from happening to happen in various times. And so, I mean, that, that is a complicating factor if, if that continues to happen. And so it's not a good sign, obviously, right? Um, okay, let's but, ask a question from Jakub Adamitz. He's joining us from Bank, Banka Bistrica, and he posted a question in the chat. He says, do you think the world and Europe in particular has taken sufficient economic and military measures to prevent other possible aggressions in the future all over the world. And then we have one more question by Dennis uh, or Denise. Um, I think it's no secret that a lot of people in Europe, particularly in Slovakia where you are now, uh, support Russia. In some European countries, even the parties in power and presidents do not hide that, like in Hungary, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think it's causing this excitement? So, um, first on the question of deterrence, you know, no, I mean, obviously, the big problem that we have is we're finding that there hasn't been sufficient deterrence against dictators from conquering neighboring territories, right? That's really the key issue in the war, is this war is being fought, will be fought, and I hope eventually be won, you know, to establish deterrence that, uh, that it becomes impossible or more difficult for a dictator to just boldfacedly just conquer a neighboring territory and destroy its population, um, mine its entire territory, blow up all its apartment buildings, launch miss cruise missiles at supermarkets, as happened yesterday. Um, that sort of thing is it was obviously not deterred in Europe. We have a war. I think I think it just maybe takes a second to think about the scale of this war. This war has already dwarfed the war in Afghanistan, the Soviet war in Afghanistan in the seventy nine, in terms of casualties on the Russian side. Russia lost maybe seventy thousand troops in Afghanistan. It's lost maybe two hundred thousand here. Ukraine has lost probably over 100,000 troops. This is a very, very big war. It's a very substantial war and it's happening right in the middle of Europe. So yeah, this is a huge security problem and um, it hasn't been deterred. The question, that is why I think at the end of the day with the West, people argue that there's fatigue that's emerging. I think it's actually the reverse. I think what's emerging at this point is a consensus that, um, we have to fight this. We have to fight this aggression because the alternative is that we live in a world where uh, dictators can regularly do this. Um, in terms of support for Russia, look, you know, support for Russia, I think at some level is very, very hard to understand, right? Because if you look at the war crimes that were, you know, conducted in Bucha, if you look at the rapes that are regularly practiced um, in, uh, in this war by the Russian army, if you look at the absolutely disgusting attacks on civilians population, which by the way, we, we should also remark on Russia's behavior in Syria, the destruction of Aleppo, for instance, right? This has been a, a typical strategy, the, the same exact strategy that played out in Aleppo and played out in Syria of Russia's um, bombardment and, 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 and torture and humanitarian abuses can't be supported. I, I, I really doubt that the, those people who uh, support Russia in the Euro European Union, that they really are thinking about the human rights abuses. I think in this audience, I, I understand most people are supporting human rights but you can't, you can't support human rights and support Russia at the same time here. Russia has absolutely violated every single aspect of human rights of Ukrainians um, in this situation to the point where this is effectively seen as a genocidal war, right? The, the point is to wipe out Ukrainians, you know, make them Russians, or just in fact, Russia would be happy if the whole territory were empty, uh, empty of Ukrainians. So, um, so I don't, I don't think people actually support Russia. <laughs> you know, I think what, what you have is that in Slovakia, for instance, that people, the, the polls are not, do you support Russia? The polls are 
saying that um, that a, ma a majority of Slovaks believe in Russia's um, justification for the war, that they believe that NATO sort of provoked Russia to do all these horrible things, right? And that's kind of a different thing. I, I, in other words, there's a distinction. If you said, do you support all these horrible things Russia's doing? I don't think a majority of Slovaks would actually say that. But if you say, well, well were they provoked to do these horrible things by the fact that NATO was there? You know, I guess they would say, you know, like 50% would say that that's a possibility. And I have to, you know, I, I don't, I, I have to some extent I agree with this, right? You know, you have to look at things as you see from all different angles. And although I don't believe it would have been rational, it was rational for Russia to look at this situation and feel um, provoked, uh, such that they had to invade Ukraine. I mean, that's not the, not a not a rational, in my view, perspective. But at the same time, it may have been the Russian perspective. Right. It may have been the Russian perspective that they looked at this and said, you know, a situation that I would have thought was very peaceful and normal where there's, you know, they could look at and say, this is a provocative situation and we have to invade. Right. So I think there's a little bit of, there's a lot of nuance that, that tends to be left out of these public opinion, um, uh, public opinion surveys. All right. Um, thank you. That's uh you know, interesting nuance, yeah. Uh, Dr. Surova, please uh, ask your question. Thank you. So, Professor, you have said that the end of the conflict will be when Ukraine is in EU and NATO. Did I got that right? Yes. So, but what we are hearing actually here from the key stakeholders um, uh, is that uh, actually we hear quite opposite narrative, and that is that Ukraine can join EU and NATO only after the conflict finishes there. So I'm wondering based on what kind of arguments you build your claim. I think that um, what we've seen is that Russia is absolutely unwilling to have uh, Ukraine separated from its sphere of influence. And therefore it, it will have to be defeated at least inside of Ukraine, before um, this war can basically end. So, in other words, if if there's a peace agreement, like <clears throat> like um, at uh, Munich, right, where Russia where Russia invades uh, the Sudetenland, or Russia invades rather Eastern Ukraine and is given the Sudetenland. I mean, Eastern Ukraine, right, and uh, Russia will will move again. To take more territory. The war will not be over. Um, the war will simply be paused. Um, so the war can't end really until Russia is in fact defeated and pushed out of Ukrainian territory. And I think um, so it, it, you raise a good question, which comes first and, and second. I mean, I think the EU is now, in my view, committed to having Ukraine as a member. It's going to happen. And exactly in what format um, reconstruction will happen, exactly in what format, exactly how it happens. I think those are all things, as you say, that are up for debate right now. People are talking about them. But if you take a sort of somewhat longer view about the situation, I think the answer is Russia will be defeated and Ukraine will join NATO and the EU. Okay, just, just Mirsad, if I may, uh, one more question. Uh, so when you think that the war will end? In what kind of yeah so i mean frame? that 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 is very hard to say like i mean as an expert on these matters it's very frustrating that we don't have a crystal ball and can't see the future you know so i don't know what the future will hold exactly but i would say that um i would say that uh it may be um it may take a long time or it may take a short time we really that's that's the biggest really wild card right now the war also, by the way, it could be won in Ukraine, but it could also be won in Moscow, and it could be won in Washington, right? So, um, so it's not 100% clear where the battlefield is, actually. I think that's something that's been lost in a lot of the debates about Ukraine, is that the battlefield is much, much broader. Um, Professor, um, Professor uh, um, was um, was was uh, mentioning earlier a paper I wrote called Putin the Green that was about the energy war in Europe. And this was a less noticed aspect of the war, but 
but Russia fought a war against European Union energy, right? It was trying to cut off energy supplies to Europe so that Europe would stop supporting Ukraine, right? And Russia lost that war. In the end, Europe was able to maintain its supplies, cut prices, and restore sources from other, other places. And Russia lost that aspect of the war, but people don't think about that as being part of the war. Um, but it was part of the war. It actually prolonged the war quite a lot because Putin has been looking for various ways to shorten the war by forcing uh, the West to somehow accede to what he wants. Um, and he's failed so far to do that. It's interesting in that article, you also caution to cancel or rather to count Russia off in that article on Putin the Green, right? Um, so maybe we'll see what do you think by saying don't you know count him off. But before that, we have uh, uh, Robert uh, McNeil joining us. Uh, Robert, please turn on your microphone, introduce yourself, tell us where you're coming from and ask your question. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you, Mersad. Um, I'm speaking from Scotland. And my question is, do you know at what stage the current investigation into war crimes uh, against the Ukraine is and following uh, what happened to Milosevic and other dictators, should Putin be worried? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that um, if, I mean, the, the, I don't, I, I really don't believe that um, that any NATO troops are gonna go into Russia. And therefore, there's no necessity in which uh, Putin somehow delivered to The Hague. I think that's a very low probability event, actually, right? But there's no question that um, Ukraine, Ukraine is pursuing, will pursue, and will continue to pursue war crimes charges um, against um, Putin. And he may be tried in absentia at some point. I can't say exactly where it's at, but I know that I did, I did, I should have been able to, I was at a Ukraine conference actually in Canada about a week ago in which um, several, you know, investigators and human rights professionals were there. Um, and it is in fact proceeding and they are developing the case and it will be prosecuted, you know, so, so that will happen. I mean, Ukraine will not let this go just that, you know, it wants its territory, but then it also to some extent wants reparations and it wants um, access to Russian funds in the West that are being frozen in the West and it wants an articulation of the human rights abuses and the war crimes. And I think it will get all of that, at least in the West. I don't foresee Putin being in The Hague, um, but if there were some Russian government, I suppose, that, that you know, wished that to happen, then perhaps they could make that happen. But um, I think that that's unlikely. As the recent article said, you know, the changes in Russia happen very fast. <laughs> yes. So, so um, you know, maybe he may not end in um, um, in uh, Hague, but uh, maybe the Russian court will, will step in eventually, as you said. Okay, so if uh, we don't have any more questions, or do we, uh, so that we can... Um, uh, wrap up our discussion today. It's about an hour into it. Uh, so anybody else has a questions? And by the way, thank you, Robert, for asking your question. Um, it was on my mind too, like to wonder what's going on with that. Uh, there was a talk about it a couple of months ago and then somehow it, things died down. So I was wondering what's going on with that investigation also. Um, so uh, looks like there's no more questions. So any final thoughts or any final concluding remarks you want to make, uh, Professor Einstein? Uh, no, I just want to thank you for inviting me today. It's really been a pleasure. Um, thank you, Dr. Sarova. Thank you, uh, Professors uh, Krish Dorats and, and uh, Shkutova. 